Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Roseboro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. All right, so you may have heard of dichotomy versus trichotomy. Is man made up of a body and soul, or is it body, soul, and spirit? And if you listen to the um, the Word of Faith prosperity heresy, Oh, they've got an elaborate theology developed regarding trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit. And uh, I've invited Stephen Kozar onto the program. Stephen Kozar, good to see you, senor. Good to be here, Chris. <laughs> so you and I have been talking about this for a couple of weeks now. And um, the best way I can put it is that uh, when you just do a careful study of dichotomy versus trichotomy, a lot of people are careful. And uh, they're careful because they don't want to go beyond or push farther than what the Scripture says. And so they, they are very careful to, uh, to stay within the limits. And I would note that in kind of studying this out among Lutheran theologians is that, uh, that there is some kind of a hint that uh, there may be a little bit of a, of a, of a distinction between spirit and soul— the issue is, is that these are phrases that are used interchangeably in Scripture, and so whatever that distinction is, uh, it's one that's not explained in Scripture, but oh my goodness, you come to the Word of Faith people, and they have an extremely well-developed trichotomous view, and they've got us chopped up into so many pieces. My question is, uh, do they understand that at the end of the day, that even though you have a body and a soul, there's only one of you, not two of you? I, that's kind of my question, you know? Your thoughts as we start off on this this crazy road that you've set us down. I'm blaming well, you for this, Gozar. I actually want to give credit. I was just thinking about this the other day. It was Marcia Montenegro who told me about this book, I don't know, three, four years ago? Yeah, yeah, the Bowman book. Yep. And it's because of this book that Robert Bowman Jr. is in the American Gospel movie, because I really, I told Brandon, you got to hear his viewpoint. You've got to read his book. You've got to see how he explains the Word of Faith movement, because he really goes to the origins, and he gets to the, the very heart of the Word of Faith movement. Um, and one of the things that Bowman says that just I couldn't let go of was, if you take away the Word of Faith view of the trichotomy view of man, that we are distinctly made into three distinct parts, if you take yeah. that away from them, their entire theological framework just dissolves into thin air. And yeah, I, no, I think that's right. And so uh, it's been one of those things that it's a little bit difficult to explain. It's not something you can just, you know, in a couple of catchphrases, explain to people without it having to basically sound like you're you're just spinning a bunch of words together. So I'm so glad to do this with you because you're the you're the guy gonna you're gonna do a little bit of the heavy lifting in this program to explain okay. exactly where the biblical texts say what they say and where they don't say what everyone thinks they say and. I, I have to say, I am really frustrated with how much the Internet, even though I love the fact that you're on the Internet, I'm on the Internet, we're using YouTube, it's a good thing, but there are people with much larger channels than us who don't know what they're talking about. They literally yeah. don't know what they're talking about, and they come across as experts, and we're going to show that. Yeah, so I'm going to change views here, and uh, we're going to whirl up our desktop, and uh, you've sent a, a video for us to kind of work our way through. And uh, let's take a look at uh, at how this is set up. We're going to be borrowing uh, portions of the American Gospel documentary series, uh, talking about dichotomy versus trichotomy, and, and how the Word of Faith Prosperity Preachers, their whole theology absolutely depends on trichotomy. And uh, and so we'll let uh, we'll we'll let Robert Bowman explain this from the uh, the American Gospel series. Here One of the foundational assumptions or doctrinal premises, if you will, of the Word of Faith movement is this idea of trichotomy that human beings are fundamentally threefold in nature that they have a soul and a body, but that essentially human beings are spirits. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in, you live in a physical body. Now, I got to stop right there. That is Gnosticism. That mm. is flat-out Gnosticism. So the, the best way I can put it is, is what Scripture reveals is that 
we all, we do have a body, we do have a spirit or soul, and those spirit and souls are used interchangeably. Right. And that the two come together in an organic unity, and you are that, okay? Death is the ripping apart of that. Let's, let's do a little biblical work here so that we can kind of see how this is all playing out. In fact, I've got to go back into Genesis. What did I do with my Genesis text? Oh, that's Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it is, Genesis chapter 2. All right, so here's what it says in Genesis 2. Uh, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for Yahweh Elohim had uh, not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and the, watering the whole face of the ground. Then Yahweh Elohim formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living, and here's, the, the, the ESV translates it as creature, but the Hebrew is nefesh, a living soul or a living spirit, the, kind of the idea here. Hmm. And, and so you'll note that our body is, you know, the, the body of Adam is formed, and he's, it's completely lifeless. And God breathes into him the breath of life, and he becomes a living soul. And the idea then is, is that there's an organic unity. There is not, so there is not three of you. And here's the thing it is Gnosticism that teaches that the physical, tangible things of the world, uh, these were all an accident. And, uh, and, and what's really real is the spiritual, and the, uh, and the physical is of almost no consequence. Uh, and so when when you hear uh, Kenneth Copeland, in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna just back this up a smudge. When he said what he said, I want you to listen carefully because he's. Uh, he, he, how do you know when Ken Copeland's lying because his lips are moving? <laughs> um, anyway, but uh, let's let's see what he says. Again. Spirits, you are a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in. You live in a physical body. This this is, is nonsense, okay? God made us a living soul, all right. And and this this is this is bonkers what he's just saying. This this chops you up, and uh, and somehow you, you, you're a spirit basically in a in a earth in a flesh suit. That's not correct. And so, you know, when we take a look at other passages, we'll do a little bit of biblical work here. So we've got the living soul here, and then the flesh. In uh, Luke, in Luke uh, chapter one, in uh, the that famous portion of scripture uh, where we get the Magnificat from, yeah, we'll note that. Uh, in fact, let me make the Greek just a little bit smaller here. Uh, Mary says, "My soul, my suke, my my soul magnifies the Lord, and my numa, my numa spirit rejoices in God, my Savior." You're gonna note she uses the term spirit and soul interchangeably. Mm-hmm. And that that's a common thing in scripture that it it there there is no hard and fast rule that suke is some kind of uh earthy, you know, broken psyche mm-hmm. of you. Uh and, and in fact this wouldn't make any sense. My broken psyche magnifies the Lord and my spirit man rejoices in God my savior. It it just doesn't work that way, okay? So that's another text. And then you'll note what Christ says here in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, in verse 28 in particular, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Um, and in fact, I need to make this a little smaller so I can actually see, you know, see the text in front of me. Cannot kill the suke. Rather, fear him who can dro- destroy both body and soul, a uh, soul and body in hell. All right? So you'll note the two, the two go together. All right? So note it doesn't say, rather fear the one who can destroy your soul in hell. Uh, you, you'll note that hell, at the, end of the, at the end of the age, when Christ returns, everybody is resurrected from the dead, all right? The, the righteous, the unrighteous, everybody is resurrected, and there are for real human beings who are thrown into the lake of fire, uh, and uh, all of them's going in. And there's no separation at that point. They will, they will, they will uh, exist in hell, uh, being punished for eternity, you know, with the soul and body reunited together. And so the idea here is, is that the two, a body and soul, comprise an organic whole. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then we have other t- passages along these lines. Um, so let's see here. For we are of good courage. Let's see. I think verse uh, – let's see here. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. So we are, uh, we are of good courage, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, but we would rather be uh, away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, this is talking about the intermediate state for Christians. Uh, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive what is uh, his due, what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. And so you're going to note in the intermediate state, we have the tearing apart of body and uh, and spirit, the uh, tearing apart of body and soul, so that uh, our soul is with Christ, uh, it, with him in heaven during the intermediate state. Then after the resurrection, soul and body are reunited, or spirit and body are reunited, and uh, we will be with the Lord forever in a new earth, resurrected, okay? So we're not going to be up, you know, as spirit beings playing harps on cloud nine, which really sounds really boring to me. Um, Well, I was just looking at verse eight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. If Mm -hmm. the trichotomy view is correct, we should hear something about Paul saying, that I'm already one with the Spirit of God in my spirit. Yes, Because that's yes. what they teach. They teach that you have this very distinct, there's like a, a wall between our soul and our spirit. And if we can just push our soul on the other side of the wall clearly enough, we'll be in bliss right now on earth because our spirit is perfect and sinless and is at one with Christ. And it also is where, not for everybody, but for a lot of them, they say, well, the reason why your spirit isn't in touch with God and doing all that it's supposed to do and why your soul is having more of an effect on you is because you're not speaking in tongues. So you yeah, that, build, no, that's, that's correct. You've got to yep, build up your abs- spirit by speaking in tongues. And, this, and it doesn't make any sense because it's spiritual and you're now communicating directly with God. And all, it doesn't make any sense because that's the spirit language. So that's all tied together. Yep. Uh, no, you, what you brought out is right. Let me show you another text along these lines. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 uh, talking about uh, what happens uh, at death, it says, uh, you know, at uh, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit, and here it's a uh, Hebrew word, ruach, the spirit returns to God who gave it. All right? So here you, you got a clear passage that talks about at death, the, our physical body returns to the earth, and the spirit returns to, the, uh, returns to God. Uh, and so that, that's what death is. It's a tearing apart of the two. 1 Corinthians uh, 7 says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is an- anxious about the things of, of the Lord, how to please the Lord. The married man is anxious about worldly things and how to please his wife. That last part we all say amen. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord and ha- uh, how, uh, how to be holy in body and what? Spirit. Spirit. Okay. Yeah, so you'll, you'll note here. Now, this is not to say that there is uh, there isn't some there are, there aren't passages that kind of lend themselves to the trichotomous view. But I'm going to point this out. There are only two, mm-hmm. for real. And when you consider what they're saying, you can't uh, arrive at the other conclusions that they're arriving at. So what we're I think one of the big takeaways I want people to have here is that the the Bible is super measured in what it says in this regard, and it's all the additional extrapolations based on trichotomy that, mm-hmm. that these people are teaching that are nowhere taught in Scripture. And already we've heard Kenneth Copeland say, you are a spirit, you have a body. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, okay. Rose bros created by God, body and soul, and I'm an organic unit uh, that goes together. That's what a human being is. And death is this unnatural ripping apart of the two things that God put together. Again, go back to Genesis. But uh, let me let me show you uh, those two texts. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Um, so I'm going to note here, the, uh, the, the that's kind of the point of what Paul's saying here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, may God, you know, sanctify you through and through every bit of you from the tip of your head to the tippy toes of your toes, you know, all of you and, and everything in between. That's kind of the point. 
And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here you have you know, the, the, you know, spirit and soul being used in a way where it seems like there's a distinction. But the whole point is, is that this is a text that's basically saying all of you. Let me give you a mm-hmm. cross-reference here, okay? So in Matthew 22, um, listen to uh, what this text uh, says uh, in, in context, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they uh, gathered together. Uh, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the Torah? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And I'm going to make a note here, is that in some cases, uh, the word suke, you could translate it mind, okay? <laughs> And so, oh, oh, oh you know, so, but th- th- that's the whole point is this, when you start talking like this, you know, just like I said, may, you know, may God bless you from the tip of your nose to the tip of your toes. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll talk about your spleen and all that. Uh, everything, the whole point is, is that I'm talking about all of you. Okay, this is not trying to make a theological distinction between all of these parts. It's right. talking about in totality. And so that's what Paul is talking about here. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may you, uh, you know, your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not—we're okay, going to note here. It's not saying what uh, Andrew Womack says. It's not saying what Kenneth Copeland says. It's not saying— it, it, and there are some out there who sit there and go, well, just as the uh, the as God is uh, is is uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're we're trichotomous. That's not what that's saying either. That that's going way beyond this text. Okay, way beyond this point, text. The whole point is the totality. Now, here's the other one, and this is the only other one. For the word of a God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. So here you got suke and uh, panuma, you know, being, you know, like the division between the joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And, and so here's the thing here. This, the, If you can consider the next part, joints and marrow, all right, that you know, are you going to make a solid theological distinction between joints and marrow at this point, then thoughts and intentions of the heart. The whole point here is is that uh, this is talking about kind of the way the Word of God works in a way that convicts us, reveals our true intentions, and uh, and and things of this nature. You know, and this it's it's the thing that's living and active, and to push too hard on this division of soul and spirit without any other text that really tees out that distinction is an unwise thing to do. This is why then Lutheran uh, dogmaticians would note that um, that when you're very careful along these lines, uh, there's a way in which looking at this distinction, uh, it, it's, it's a distinction that, you know, it's all the same thing, but there may be a way of talking about what's in charge or what's not in charge. But it's a that's a longer discussion, and I would actually uh, recommend at that point, if somebody wants to do kind of a more in-depth kind of walk-along thing, then look at the video that uh, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller put together on this yeah. topic. Uh, but the thing is, is that here's the thing. We've now walked through the texts. All right? That's We've it. We've now walked. That's it. All right? <laughs> okay. And uh, you're going to note here... Um, all the remaining theology bits that we're going to hear from these false teachers, it ain't in any of these texts. Oh, well, there's a division, body, soul, and spirit. And so you got, so, and then, you know, so let me give you an example here. All right. So one of my least favorite people on planet earth, uh, Andrew <laughs> Womack. Okay. He has an entire animated series on this topic. And I, and I want you to listen to this theology and just ask yourself this question. Is any of this theology taught in these biblical texts that we just look at regarding trichotomy and dichotomy. Let's, let's, let's listen in for a little bit. That is righteous and holy. You are as pure and holy in your spirit as Jesus is because it's... Now, you'll note here, the, the guy in green, that's your body. Uh, the, the gray guy, that's your personality. That's your soul. And then you got your spirit man, okay? He's totally perfect, righteous, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm ta- starting to talk like Andrew Walmack. Anyway, let's keep going here. Righteousness that has been given unto you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says that Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus has become our righteousness. 
Yeah, he has. But <laughs> yeah, and we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That has nothing to do with trichotomy. And as you get your soul in agreement with what is already transpired in your spirit. Now, this is the part. No text says any of this. So here we've got the gray soul guy. Uh, and this is where uh, you're all screwed up. This is where depression comes from. This is where uh, evil lusts and uh, intentions, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And the the, pro- the reason why you're not experiencing health and prosperity in your life is because your soul is in an agreement with your spirit. This is what they say. Okay, so you got to get your soul to look into the mirror of your spirit so that uh, all the all the perfect, uh, glorious things that you are in your spirit man can then transform the thinking of your of your soul man, which is really messed up, and then you'll start to see the benefits in your life. Listen to what he says. Then you see the physical benefit. Your spirit has to flow through your soul to get into your body, into the physical world. What text says that? Uh, and I tell you, Chris, this is how you can establish literally a type of cult yeah where everything you say and every every book you sell every dvd you sell every conference you go to people who have been taught this never get the results that they want because it doesn't right. work because it pretend it's like a make believe world and the, it's it lays the foundation for them to always feel like oh i'm almost there i i don't quite I haven't quite got my spirit man to overcome my soul and my body. But if I go to the next conference or I buy his next book or, or whatever, yep. you're always in bondage to this idea and to right. the teachers who teach it. Yeah. So you, 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 go, you go to Andrew Womack. How come my, my beard is still gray? I'm still ugly. I'm getting older every day and I'm overweight. Well, your spirit man hasn't talked to your soul man and had the impact of going from the spirit into the physical into your body. And so that this, none of this stuff is taught in Scripture. None of this. Uh, this is just and, a flat-out myth. And it okay? works. You, you, yep. you start using language. Andrew Womack is the worst because he uses language that does make reference to to uh, the imputed righteousness of Christ. He mentions it quite a bit. and Yeah, but he misappropriates right, it. He misappropriates right next to a comment about the imputed righteousness of Christ. He then fades that into something about this body, soul, and spirit stuff and, and makes yep. it sound like you just have to access the spirit man that's been given to you freely by the atonement of Christ. And like, okay, so now I have to access this thing. I have to somehow tap into. He actually uses this language. You have to tap into your spirit, man. And one of the things that Bowman writes about that really made sense to me is that this creates a very bizarre sort of anti-intellectualism yep. that has to be taught by, by hours and hours of teaching. So it's yeah. anti-intellectual in the sense that they're telling you to shut off your mind because they teach that mm-hmm. your mind is part of your soul. The bad part of you is your mind. Yeah, and, and you got to turn the t- turn your thoughts off and just let right. the spirit flow. This is why speaking in tongues is so important because that's the the achieving <laughs> of the complete quieting of your mind and just letting your spirit do its thing. And if yeah. this was true, they would stop teaching about it. They would say, okay. I'm done. I told you what you need to do. Now go babble in tongues for as long as it takes until you overcome your soul and you have complete sanctification in this world. But they don't. They go on and on and they talk and talk yep. and talk. And it's all a bunch of nothing. And it leaves you in bondage. Yep. Don't get me, let me started. Let me play Jody. a little bit, uh, let me yeah, play a little bit more from Andrew. I got to back up just a smidge because this is just nonsense. But Listen. With what is already transpired in your spirit, then you see the physical benefit. Your spirit has to flow through your soul to get into your body, into the physical world. The soul has a valve on it. And basically that is the fun. Where in Scripture does it say the soul has a valve on it? Well, let's see, the problem right here is that your negative power coupling coming through your soul valve, you know, you, you just got your you got your currents crossed there right there. So you and so when you're hitting the valve, it's it's open it's closing up rather than opening up. And so yeah. See, Chris, I think you got the wrong coupler on there. You got a three sixteenths when you should have a three eighths. See, that's yeah, the well I forgot right to get my I got for, forgot to get my hex scatzafrats out and you know, and turn it counterclockwise three turns. You know, this is nuts. Well, you you didn't use your torque wrench on there. If you don't have a torque (laughs) wrench, you're not going to get the right pressure. And especially if you're using a 316th instead of the 3 8 
Right. I, how what, what PSI is my spirit working through this valve? That's well, what I yeah, want to know. That's where the torque wrench comes in. And that's a yeah. whole other key thing. I'm going to have to spend a couple more hours on that next time I come <laughs> well, into Well, we're going to need to examine this using my lawn chairs in a, in a, in a <laughs> well, can of bud. And, you know, but anyway, it, let's, uh, let's keep going. Of your Just, mind, your mental, emotional part, the soulish part of you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead already indwells every born-again believer. But if your mind is like a valve, and if it's closed to that, if it doesn't embrace that truth and renew its mind and get to where what you see in the Word of God, in the spiritual mirror, if that doesn't become more real to you than what you see in your physical mirror, then it's possible for this resurrection life that's in your spirit to be completely shut off, just like you would shut the valve on a faucet, and you say, but I feel sick. My body hurts. The doctor says I'm dying. Here's my... <laughs> yeah, you're sick, and your body hurts, and you're dying because you have cancer. You're going to be dead in a week. You know, well, that's that's just that's just your soul lying to you. Your spirit wants to tell you something different, man. Th I told you you got the wrong coupler on your valve. <laughs> this is flat-out mythology. Wow. Medical record. And if those things dominate you, that soul can shut off that power so that not one drop of God's life-giving power... So there's your soul. You're, it's got the valve closed. It's got its eyes closed. It refuses to listen to the Spirit. The Spirit wants to save you, man! But no, your your spirit, your soul valve is all clogged up. It touches your physical body, and you can die sick, having the resurrection life of... Christians have died sick for 2,000 years. This is nuts. God on the inside of you. All right, you, you get the idea. So this, this trichotomy, uh, Bowman's right. If, if, this, if trichotomy falls, their whole theological system falls. And the reality is, Scripture uses soul and spirit interchangeably in Christ talks about the fact don't fear the one who can destroy your body but destroy, fear the one who can destroy both your body and your your soul in hell all right let's let's come back then to uh, this video that you uh, gave us and uh, let's keep going here because this is loads of fun <clears throat> and as spirits they are in the same class or category of being as God God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. Ah, so trichotomy is the foundation of the little God's doctrine. Uh-huh, got it, yep. okay. And like God as a spirit, we can call into existence what we say. We serve a God who calls things that do not exist as if they already existed. We just... Yeah, that's God. Though. ...make positive confessions, and then those positive confessions will then turn into physical reality. So the positive confessions are your spirit man trying right. to train your soul to let the spirit power of the resurrection flow through the valve that to come to your your body thingy. And and the the way this works is for the guy on stage with a microphone he just tells stories about his own life whether they're true or not we'll never know because we'll never we'll never be close with this guy. <clears throat> right. <laughs> No one will ever see Joyce Meyer up close and personal and go to her house and hang out with her. So she can talk about all the victory she might be having. Andrew yep. Womack, Kenneth Copeland, they can all tell stories from a stage. And it's a it's a uh, a narrative that they tell about all the success that they're experiencing. And then you're you're thinking to yourself, well, I want to do all the stuff that they're doing. I want to have the success that they're having. But it's all pretend. At best, this it's a narrative that we'll never be able to test. This is a this is Amway. This is Amway. Uh, I'm I'm actually working on a video right now, and it's taking me forever because it's all about how these pastors all go to each other's churches and they all promote each other and they all yep. compliment each other, and it's a closed set of ideas. As long as you stay inside of that closed set, it all seems to back each other up. So all these people talking about the body, soul, and spirit, they don't do what we just did. It didn't take very long to look up all the verses in the Bible that <laughs> yep. talk about how we don't have three parts, how we actually have two parts. They just don't right. do it. They don't right. look at the, the whole of Scripture. It's not that hard. No, and, it, and the thing is, is that, and there's not two of me, and who I am consists of both the body and the soul, the body and the spirit. They, 
The, 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 uh, uh, all right, let's keep going. So that's how powerful your words are. Your words have created power. Just as God made the world by speaking words of faith, according to these teachers, we can essentially bring into reality or bring into expression what we are hoping for, what we want, because we're the same kind of being as God. This is just, this is Gnosticism, man. It sure is. It's a major component of Gnosticism was this very distinct separation and, and your body was everything that was wrong with you yeah. and your soul was perfect. You just got to get in touch with it more. Well, they yeah. add, I think, the, the trichotomy view adds this idea of a soul. I think it's a little yeah. different. Yeah, no, yeah. it is a little bit different, but at, at its core, the, this this rhymes with Gnosticism. This right. It, it kind of reeks of it. And, yeah, Gnosticism uh, is everywhere. It's sneaking around the outskirts of Christianity from the very beginning, and elements of Gnosticism have always been threatening true Christianity. Yeah, it's been the arch enemy of Christianity for 19 centuries. That, that could be another show for us to go up, uh, into detail about, because I, I, I think there are... Uh, components of Gnosticism that we just are so familiar with in the evangelical world that we just assume them to be true, like this body, soul, and spirit thing. Everybody yeah. just keeps repeating it over and over, and everyone just assumes it must be true because famous people have said it. Yeah, that, that's not the way you test, by the way. All right, let's I keep know. going. This is an interesting video you've put together, sir. Right. And so the kingdom is a it represents a tri uh, a triune healing for the whole person. What? <laughs> Spirit, soul, and body. Yeah, that, that's from your video, I think. But anyway, real quickly, yeah. I just... That, this is Andrew Womack. ...shared that the Lord showed me that when I got born again, it was my spirit that was changed, not my... Uh, yeah, did, did notice he didn't say a biblical text. The Lord yep. showed me... Well, and you know uh, what, Chris? He teaches essentially the same thing as Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin yep. just came a couple decades earlier, but he never gives credit to anybody. He makes it really clear every time he talks about this, that mm -hmm. this came directly from God. I learned this directly from God, not not even from the Bible per se. He learned it, and then he saw it in Scripture. Yeah, and I, I, we, I just finished up this series on hearing the voice of God, and I, so he's basically saying, he's claiming direct revelation here. The Lord showed me. That ain't the voice of God, because God's now gone beyond the scriptures right. to you know, basically affirm to him via direct revelation uh, a view that's not taught in scripture. That doesn't sound like the voice of God to me. So let, let me back this up just a smudge and uh, listen again. That the Lord showed me that when I got born again, it was my spirit that was changed, not my body and not my soul. And this was a major breakthrough because scriptures that say, you know, that you... Not my body and not my soul? Um... Hello, um, <laughs> I'm going to be resurrected. I'm pretty sure Christ saved my body too. Yeah. Okay, and He saves my body through death and resurrection. All right, that which is sown, you know, mortal, you know, is going to die, and it is going to be raised eternal. Right? I'm pretty sure Christ paid the penalty for my for all of me. And that in the resurrection, I'm going to live forever, body and soul reunited. So this is this is ter this is even terrible soteriology here. I want to hear that again. This is blasphemous. <laughs> All right, good stuff, Kozar. Let's see here. Hit this. When guy. I got born again, it was my spirit that was changed, not my body and not my soul. And this was a major breakthrough because scriptures that say, you know, that you are the righteousness of God. I'd go look in the mirror, and I'd think that's not righteous, and. I'd look at my mind and my thoughts, and that wasn't totally righteous. And because of it, I was just stuck. It was like, God, I can't understand the Word. And when He showed me that it's not my body and it's not my soul that got changed, it was my spirit. And He showed me who I am in Christ and what I had in Christ. It totally revolutionized my life because God is a spirit, and God sees me in the spirit, and He relates to me in the spirit. And even when I sin, and even when I fall short... It listen, listen to what that does with the body, man. Holy sm this is this is rank Gnosticism. Wow. When I mess up, God does not change in his attitude towards me because he's a spirit and he's dealing with me in the spirit. And my spirit is sealed and sanctified and perfected forever. We talked about all of these things last year. Which biblical text? Oh, that he doesn't have any. He just says the Lord showed him that. Okay. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, got it. Okay. No, the Bible is very... All right, this is Daniel Martinez, I think. Is is that... Yeah, I forget this guy's name. Hang on a second. I'm going to back this up just... This guy has a huge channel. I was really discouraged yeah. when I found uh, this so, guy. So Daniel Maritz. Daniel Maritz. All right. The Bible is very clear. There's a huge difference between your soul and your spirit. And you we just went through all the texts. The Bible's clear there's a big difference. Where and are you I, finding these texts that make these differences? And I want to point out, once again, I know I might be pounding this issue over and over again, but Christians, just like non-Christians, they believe the famous people with the best production skills. This guy's a pretty boy. He looks nice. He sounds nice. <laughs> he, he has hey, come nice on, he's just he's just 30 years younger than both of us. We were both that great looking when we were there. <laughs> come on. <laughs> he sounds confident. He sounds like he's you know, authoritative. And everybody is so used to that. And it happens in the in the way that we've been taught by watching this famous people on television who tell yeah. us what we need to believe about everything. And it shouldn't happen to Christians, though. Christians should yeah. be the ones who are skeptical of everybody who appears to be speaking authoritatively. We need to go to Scripture first and yep. foremost. And test everybody. So that well, I mean, isn't the attitude? Uh, Oprah said it. I uh, that that I believe it. That settles it. I mean, you know, if, if Oprah has Rob Bell on, well, then Rob Bell's good, man. You know. Yeah. So that's the way yeah. most people view that whole issue. Yep. Let's keep going. You okay, need here. to know what that is. Hebrews four verse twelve says, "For the word of God is living and powerful and sharp." We just covered this text, and my question is, where is it going to go right after? And this? any two edged the other sword. Now listen to this piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of yeah when you read it in context it's not making this huge difference that you're claiming though points and marrow so the word of god cuts right between our soul and our spirit in 1 thessalonians we read now may the god of peace and yeah, we covered this text too sanctify only two. completely yep. and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ Right on. We covered how this is basically talking about all of y'all. So from these verses, it is very clear that you have a body, a soul, and a spirit. No, it's not. But you need to know that your spirit only becomes alive the moment when you are spiritually reborn. That means when you... Text, please. ...become a real reborn Christian. I'll explain a little bit more on this a little bit later on. But it's interesting that God is three in one, the Trinity, right? And so... Oh, this is not an argument. So we are made in His image, and we are also three in one. That's not a biblical argument. Body, soul, and spirit. Yes. The spirit is called pneuma. The Bible also explains this as the inner man. The soul, psyche, is the outer man. The yeah, and it's weird. Scripture uses soul and spirit interchangeably. Body, the soma, is the outermost man. So let's have a closer look at these three. First, the body is very clear, right? You see it when you look in the mirror. It's how you interact with the world. Three or five physical senses. Smell, taste, touch, hear, and see. And then your body also wants physical desires like food, shelter, sex, clothing, and so forth. Now let's move on to the soul, the psyche. Now this is the part where people communicate with you. This is basically you. It consists of yourself, meaning your identity, your personality, your character, and then your emotions, which is... So he, no, I'm going to point this out. If he says that the soul is me, he disagrees with Copeland because Copeland says the spirit is me and Womack says the spirit is me. They're all just making it up, Chris. It doesn't matter. As long as you have good graphics and you have good background music and you have a, you know, a nice yeah. soft camera with this shallow depth of field and you speak with confidence, you can say anything, especially on YouTube. Does this guy okay. belong to a church? Has this guy gone to seminary? Does this guy know I, I Greek know. and Hebrew? I, I, I'm sure he I doesn't. Don't know. I don't know. Your feelings and passions. And then your intellect, which is your mind and your thoughts. And then your will, which is your own will. And is Where is he getting all of these things from the biblical text? He's not. He, he probably copied and pasted all of this from somebody's book somewhere, and he's just repackaging okay. it. Got it. Yeah, I did see Grudem's systematic theology behind it. Which is hilarious. Because Grudem doesn't believe this. Right. <laughs> and then your conscience. And then, very importantly, not a lot of people know this, but it is also a dwelling place for evil, meaning your sinful nature and evil spirits. What? <laughs> the, the scripture says, do not gratify the desires of your flesh. And it's like, hello. <laughs> oh, this is such a mess. Okay. So if somebody hit you or poke you in your physical body, you feel pain, right? And when somebody uses abusive words, you also feel pain in your soul. Now, from the moment you're born, you only ever operated through these two, through your body and your soul. That's all you ever knew. But 
You were missing one part, your spirit, because you were born spiritually dead. Now your spirit. Now, now it's granted, we are, we are dead indeed. It's totally different from your soul. The spirit is the part where we get spiritual discernment, peace and revelation. It is the part where we communicate. I, I get peace and revelation from my spirit? In your I spirit, get, yeah. The spirit of God it talks to your spirit, and you have to access that part of what, you. What, again, perfect. what texts say this? Okay, oh, I, get revel, I get revelation from the Bible. Okay, this, wow, this is... Well, and the, you know, the, the, the even what he already said is so contradictory, because if we get revelation only in our spirit, but he said that your soul is where we have our mind and our thoughts and our intellect, how can we get the thoughts I, to enter into our spirit? If, the, if yeah. we read words from the text of Scripture, which is God's word, how can that then enter our spirit without using our intellect? Because he just told us our soul is the bad part of us, just yeah, like everybody now, else. So, yeah, so here's the thing. We've gone through the text, and he even referenced the two, but it's all this other theology that he's building off of it that none of these texts say. Right. Uh, if it's not in the Bible, it's not theology. It ain't doctrine. Okay, so where are you getting this stuff is, you know, it, yeah, you're right. He probably just copied and pasted it from somewhere. So. Okay, with God himself. So our spirit has a deeper discernment between right and wrong. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Talking about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah, spiritually is not the same as saying pneuma. This is this is nuts. Okay, yeah, and I notice that whenever these guys talk about any other verses, they they find verses that talk about the spirit, and they assume that that means the third part of us. When right. those verses don't say that, they just talk about the spirit. Yeah, so they got so a highly developed theology that's actually not taught in the Bible. That is is crossed the line into flat out mythology. And it's and, superimposed on all the other texts. Exactly, exactly. And then this is used as the explanation for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in our spirit, we also have peace. Romans 8 verse 6 says, The mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And our spirit... Wait a second. I got to look that up. Romans 8, 6, right? Okay, hang on a second. Hopefully I can get there. Romans 8. And let me just go there. I, I'm curious. For the mind... Okay, uh, set on the flesh is death, but the mind, uh, uh, thronema, on the spirit is life and peace. I just wanted to see if there was a if if that was one of the cases where mind was synonymous with suke, but it's not. It's a different word altogether. I thought I'd look, just double check because I thought that would be funny if it worked out that way. But anyway, this his theology isn't. Again, this is going way, way, way outside beyond what these texts say. receives revelation, which is insight and understanding from the Spirit of God. Ephesians 1 verse 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the Holy Spirit. In the knowledge of Him. Dichotomy. Okay, so here, here's uh, Grudem. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, it, I, how much you want to bet he's not trichotomous? Well, this is my favorite part. When I found these two videos and stuck them together, the guy we just saw he had Grudem's theology. He had Grudem's theology very, very strategically placed on the table behind him to make himself look like he actually read the book. But yep. <laughs> Wayne Grudem himself doesn't teach the trichotomy. So All right, let's, I think I think I have issues with Grudem, but I think I I've read his systematic theology, and I would say he strives to be faithful in in uh, in working with the biblical text. Say say that the spirit is not a separate part of man, but is another term for soul, and that man is made up of just two parts, body and soul or spirit. And either word could be used. Dichotomy is the view that uh, I hold, incidentally. Yeah, and he's <laughs> properly pointing out that Suke and Numa are interchangeable, and they are. He, they, he's got such an exciting personality, doesn't he? <laughs> he was, he's uh, um, he's a little dry, just you know, yeah. just just but it's, you know. I love the fact that he, the the other guy, has got all this you know kind of uh, 
emotion and he sounds so confident and then wade and grudem just comes he he, he kind of enters into the equation and just says no you're completely wrong because i disagree with you and the scripture clearly teaches otherwise right <laughs> let's, let's keep I going love it. here body only one element we just have a body and we don't have a soul used dichotomy is the view that uh, i hold incidentally the body is one part of us and soul or spirit are different words for the immaterial part of us Right. News unit says, can you explain the difference between spirit, soul, and body? Well, it's pretty simple. God is three parts. Uh, yeah, see, he's, he's, he launches off in a non-biblical argument. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and we're... This is true. God exists. Three eternal persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's not three gods, there's one God. in his image, so therefore we're three parts too. We are... No, see, that that's using logic, okay? Yep. Uh, and not biblical text. That's, that, that's not how we do doctrine. You don't go... Well, this is that, and this is the other thing, because you end up with the same thing. You, you you end up using that same kind of logic, ending up in the Word of Faith camp. You know, well, you know, God spoke things into existence. We're made in the image of God, therefore we're little gods. Therefore, we can speak things into existence. Yeah, that's and not how, that's and, not and how you do theology. Smith. Spencer Smith is an independent fundamentalist Baptist guy, and he yep. uh, says a lot of good things against the Word of Faith movement. However. Yep. I've watched a few of his videos, and if anybody's listening, I don't mean to be offensive, but I got to tell you, he doesn't know what he's talking about much of the time. When he talks about neo evangelicals, that's what he would classify anybody who's not an independent fundamentalist Baptist. He has mentioned that Brandon Kimber and me and, and you and everyone else who's in the American gospel, he classifies us as neo evangelicals. I don't think he knows right. what that term means. It right. actually and, refers and I'm to sure a, he would rebuke me for using uh, the ESV rather than King James and using the Greek and the Hebrew because he's a King James only guy. So and he sounds confident. He sounds pleasant. He sounds like he really cares about what he's speaking, and I, and I don't yep. doubt that. But he's just not very clear and educated on the history of the church. He's made some statements about how they're the only ones. He and his group are the only people in the entire world who are following scripture as the people did in the early church. Yeah, and and that's, else, that's, he, that's a typical sectarian claim of the IFB. Uh, so, it's just uh, so dumb. Yeah. It's so dumb. Right. Let's okay, sorry. Body, I want to we are a soul. We are a spirit. Now, I'm not a body that contains a soul. I'm actually a soul that inhabits a body. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, here we go again. Okay. <laughs> you are a living soul. Full stop. Okay. Yeah, so the, y y when you start tearing us apart like this into our component parts, you know. So uh, w what are you? Are you a heart with a spleen, or you know, you know, it's like, you know, no, 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 no. We we are a, a one unit, and there, and we're a composite between the body and soul for sure. But that there's only one of you. There ain't two of mm -hmm. you. And and to talk about your your flesh as if it's just some kind of meaningless meat suit. Is uh, is is you know Christ died in the flesh, and so that we can be raised again bodily from the grave. That our salvation is completed and consummated in the resurrection. So, you know, it, it, we're not going to make distinctions like this in the new earth. Thank God. Okay, just keep going. this is just my body. This is my bone and my flesh, my hair, my my head, everything that you see here. That's just that's the body that I inhabit. But that's really. No, you are a living soul. This is wow. not me. That's my soul. Now, when a person is uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, they had body, soul, and spirit. And when they partook of the tree of life, which text says that about them? Yeah, we just looked at the text, and it doesn't say that at it all. Doesn't. No. Nope. If the, or the excuse me, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, the Lord said, "You sh thou shalt surely die." Well, they took the, the that tree, and then they didn't die, did they? Or did they? Well, the answer is they did die. They didn't die physically. They didn't die a soul death, but they died spiritually that day. Uh, that part of... Now, I would agree that they died spiritually. This is true, because physically they're still moving. Uh, but uh, the, the thing he threw in there, they didn't die a soul death? Um, hello? <laughs> it's like, where are you getting this phrase? Okay, keep they're going. Being that... that communed with God, uh, died that day. The Bible says in the book of John, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And so in John chapter 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when I was born again, I was 18 years old. I wasn't given a new body. I really wasn't even given a new soul. But I was I was born in my spirit. I was born spiritually and uh, given a new nature spiritually. And that part of me that, that was dead. And, and this isn't this is not heretical the way he's talking about being raised spiritually. I, I, I got to say this is perfectly within the pale of orthodoxy. There's nothing wrong with this. It's that it's the ex, extra extrapolations that he's making beyond the text that right. is the problem. It is now alive, my spirituality, and so that is body, soul, and spirit. And uh, so you have to understand that if you're going to understand people, and, that, and that's what I talk about when I talk about marriage. You got you know you got body, soul, spirit. But you got people out there that have no spirit, and so really they're broken, and one third of their of their being is broken because they they don't have a walk with God. They're not right with God, and so you have two people out there that you know they're not they're broken, and they're trying to work as a marriage, and they're not complete people. So you notice what's really missing here is like any clear exegesis of biblical texts. You know, right? You, you can't do theology this way. You cannot do doctrine this way. You need texts in front of you. And, uh, you know, and, you know, in fact, when people would ask Jesus questions, uh, he would say, uh, well, you know what the, uh, the text say, how do you read the text? You know, as, <laughs> let's talk about the text. Yeah, yeah, right. But when they, when two people are right with God, they're born again, they get married, it can work. It really can work. And that's, I think that's part of the reason why there's so many divorces today. So, all right. So, and they, okay, so... He's got is the there same day passages. I'm starting a brand Oh no, here's why I'm at. Okay. Yeah, we're going to a okay. new series and I'm <laughs> teaching on my favorite thing to teach on uh, what I call spirit, soul and body. You know, this is the truth that just transformed my life. And it has become like the foundation of everything I teach. This is I heard one person describe this like a key that you stick in your brain and it just unlocks the Word of God. It unlocked. That's another way of saying we superimpose this doctrine yeah, on yeah, all of Scripture. Yeah, yeah. yeah see, your, prob your problem, uh, Kozar, is you didn't stick the key in your head. You know, in turn <laughs> Now we got a key. What about the valve and the coupler? I still don't yeah, have Yeah, uh, uh, you know, and the sprats of frats, man. You know, <laughs> left-handed at that. Uh, let's keep going here. All right. So, yeah, you got the idea. But uh, so, yeah. but the reality is, is that yeah, to push too hard on this, it you know, it, it's it's it, we've covered the text, we've looked at what they said, we're gonna stay in the context here, and we're gonna note that the uh, that the the biblical case for trichotomy is extremely flimsy, uh, and the biblical texts clearly are the the clear passages are in favor of this body soul or body spirit distinction because soul and body uh, soul and uh, spirit are used interchangeably in scripture. Right. And Christ talks again about, you know, don't, don't fear the one who can destroy your body, but the one who destroys body and soul in hell. Yeah, so, yeah, this is, um, yeah. But all that other stuff, all the magical hoop de doo that goes, that they've they've built on this, none of that's in the Scriptures. It's These are all extrapolations, uh, and the foundation is is their, is their false trichotomous view. That falls, the whole, the whole system is going to come crumbling down. I really hope so, this is helpful for people, too, because I, I don't want to just complain about how some people are wrong. I, I know that there are people watching this who have heard this stuff, and they're trying to somehow make that help their lives. They're trying to incorporate yeah. this into their spiritual lives, and you just throw it all away, and your life will be better. That's the problem. If this, if this is at the foundation, get rid of it, and now you will be free, I think, to, to I think, understand God's Word better. and. Yeah. You'll be free also to not be afraid of your mind and your intellect. Uh, we as Lutheran theologians specifically, but we're not the only ones, but we, we believe it's really important to use our mind. We, we believe yes. that we can take our mind as far as it goes, as far as Scripture will t allow us to take our minds. And after that, there is some mystery to our Christian faith. We don't yep. know everything. God is bigger than us. God is way above us. He's given us enough uh, information in his word, and he's given us a brain to understand his word, that we can be at peace because of what he's given us, and we don't have to go beyond that. Right. And and, and the thing is, you'll note that um, what they're ultimately doing is selling something. They're trying to yes. sell 
uh, you, you see the reason why you're not getting the results you want in your life. You're not you're not prosperous. You're not wealthy. You're not skinny. Uh, you're suffering from cancer, or you have some kind of a long-term illness. It's all because you haven't understood uh, the proper distinction of of trichotomy, and your spirit man isn't uh, get, you know undoing the valve in your soul person, and and all this kind of stuff. This is just and this is not you buy you buy into this, and you think ah this is finally the solution that I need. This is the key that's going to unlock everything, and now the blessings of God are going to flow into my life. No, they're not. You're still going to die. Okay, you know, I and here's the thing. You said, "Well, Roseboro, that's not very positive. That's a very negative confession here." Yeah, listen, we're all we're all we're all dying. Scripture says our lives are like grass. Okay, and the strength of the field, the beauty of the grass, it's here today. It's gone tomorrow. Christ didn't come to give you your best life. Now you're heading to the grave. Get over it. Okay. Get over it. Yeah, get over it. You're going to die, and and that's just how I'm going to die. I, it could happen tomorrow. It could happen today. It does. The thing is, is that I'm perfectly fine with this because I know number one, to be absent from the body, which is a period of time, which will be the case if I die before Christ's return, is to be present with Christ. Christ will bring me back with him when he returns in glory to judge the living and the dead, and he's going to reunite my soul with a resurrected body without sin. And right. I will be me put together properly in the new earth forever and ever. Amen. There's there's nothing for me here. This whole world's coming to an end. I'm coming to an end, Kozar. You're coming to an end, too. You know, I think, and so the... I think- the Go, Go ahead. ahead. <laughs> no, I, I want to hear what you got to say. <laughs> I just, I think that if you're holding on to this idea that Christianity is the tool by which God will give you all the things in this world that you desire, which is what people are being taught all day long. Yep. Yep. You, you have to let that go. You have to be at peace with the fact that you may die tomorrow. Yeah. You may die yeah. today. Not yeah, that it, we want you to die today. Not that you should want to die today. But that, if, if we have that as our foundation, then we can be at peace with sometimes God gives us success and God gives us good things and we are blessed by him. And sometimes right. he does not. And he is sovereign and he knows what he's doing and we don't need to worry about it. That's In the fact, key. We don't need to this, worry this about is, these things. This is called godliness with contentment. The Bible talks specifically about this. Paul says, I have learned how to you know do well in plenty and in want, you know, and, and yeah. to be content with what God has given me. As that great th- a theologian from the uh, Disney movie Frozen said, let it go, <laughs> let it go. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, the, uh, so here's the thing. I, I, there's like nothing, we're sojourning here. Okay, I'm just passing through. You're just passing through. And you're going to note, in passing through, things are tough. You have to toil in order to put food on the table. Yeah, God planned it that way as a punishment for a rebellion against him. Okay, you you want a world where all you got to do is reach up and grab dinner from a tree? That's in the new world, not this one. Okay, (laughs) so, you know, paradise is coming back, man, and Christ has given it away for free. And and yeah. and that's kind of the whole point. And so it's like, it, 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 how did how did Peter say? It was it Peter or Paul? If if we are to hope in Christ for this world, for this life only, we we should be pitied. Okay, right. you know. So you know, I I you know, so, well well, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Oh well, I guess that's the case. But the, <laughs> <laughs> you obviously don't know me. But yeah, you know, but the point is, is that as Christians, we are always looking forward to our hopes. So. What do you do then if you're suffering in body? You pray and you ask God to give you the strength to get through. And mm-hmm. if the, even if it means that you're going to be in pain for the next 30 years, 30 years is nothing compared with eternity, and God uses our sufferings to draw us closer to him. This is all throughout Scripture. You know, I think, I think of Joseph. This is a poor fellow. You know, God gave him two prophetic dreams, and they were prophetic dreams. He tells them to his parents and his, and his family members, and they hate him for it, right? And his brothers decide they're going to murder him, and, re- and then one of them says, well, maybe we get some money for him. So they betray him for pieces of silver. Who does that sound like, right? And so they betray And he ends up being sl- sold into slavery in Egypt, and then, you know, and then he's like the first recorded person in history of, you know, experiencing work place sexual harassment okay <laughs> i've never thought about that yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah you know it's and, and here's the deal it was the, it was the woman doing it not the dude and so his uh his his boss's female wife you know she you know employer she was the one having the hots for him she falsely accuses him he ends up in prison for 13 years man 
And, you know, and he didn't have his best life now, all right? And now, granted, God eventually let him out, but the thing is, is that he learned. He learned to trust in God, and when he comes out, he's not vengeful. He's mm-hmm. not uh, seeking, uh, you know, his brother's heads on a pike. In fact, he, you know, they're terrified of him when, they, when he reveals himself to them, and he says, don't worry, what you intended for evil, God has worked for good. And Scripture says that for us as Christians in Philippians. You know, all things will work together for good for those who love the Lord. So he's going to make all of our paths straight. There's a new world coming. Christ is going to vindicate us. And and I I, you know, I preach about this you know often, especially when we just got done with the eschatological text in November. Is that uh, you know? Look at me. I'm I look worse now than when I got started. You know, it's like. Look at how much gray is going on in here. It's like, you know, it's like I look older this year that's than why, I did last year. That's why I don't have a beard. It would be very gray. Yeah, I did yeah, right. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I'm hiding my glory. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm putting my glory out on, on camera every week. But the, the point is this, is that there is a day coming when, 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 our, when our youth, our strength, our fortunes, everything is going to be restored. In fact, let, let me do this real quick here. Hang on a second here. I, I want to pull up a biblical text because this will be helpful. Okay. Isaiah 61. And uh, let me pull up the Hebrew just to upset the uh, the King James only people. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, listen to this text. Uh, this, so this, uh, this is Isaiah prophesying about the end of the world, but also there's Christ in here too. The spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the pris- uh, opening of the prison of those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God. And so you'll know these are wonderful themes. And, and these are the words that Christ took up when he was in the uh, synagogue in Nazareth, and they decided they were going to throw him over the cliff because he said this was re- this was uh, fulfilled in their hearing, right? But note here, the poor here is refining the poor in spirit, those who, who recognize that they're sinners, uh, the brokenhearted, those who mourn over their sin, liberty to the captives, that's you and I. We're, we're, we, we were born in captivity to sin, death, the devil, a world that's corrupt, all, you get the whole thing. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor is that great picture of the jubilee, the year when all the debts are canceled, the inheritances are restored, slaves are set free. It's a picture of salvation. To comfort those who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, so that they may be called the oaks of righteousness. And you'll note that in the new earth, uh, rather than our lives being likened to grass, our lives are being likened to oaks. I like the, I like the difference, right? So uh, we are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many uh, generations. And then going on, for the Lord, I love justice. I hate robbery. I'll faithfully give them their recompense. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, their descendants in the midst of the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the offspring of the Lord. And I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall exult in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation, covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom, decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, like a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and it, as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so Yahweh will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This is a picture of what's coming. And then you, th- you can throw into the mix Psalm 129. This is just a wonderful text too. I'm I'm kind of free, you know, free roading it here. But yeah, uh, let's see here. Um, oh, is it? It's not 129. Hang on a second here. I, I I'm doing this from memory, but uh, let me look at the text real quick. I'm going to grab. While this you're looking off. it up, I want to say something to everybody listening, and that is, Chris Roseboro has a channel of his church uh, sermons, his, uh, your uh, Kanzvinger. Yeah, kanzvingerchurch.org. And you put that link underneath the description of all your Fighting for the Faith videos. And I, I really yeah. want to encourage everybody to listen to this man's sermons. Don't just listen to Fighting for the Faith, although I want you to listen to Fighting for the Faith, obviously. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate your sermons. And uh, a lot of people who know my channel know that on the Messed Up Church every week, I put my pastor's sermons too. And I, yeah. I think that people who are coming out of evangelicalism, they're used to hearing a sermon that's really long with a couple of scripture verses thrown in. And I want them to see how different it is in a traditional yeah. Lutheran church where the scripture is the focus 
of the sermon. It's the focus of the entire service, actually. And scripture yep. is just kind of surrounding everything that takes place. And what you're demonstrating right now, Chris, is that same thing. We as Christians are surrounding ourselves with God's word in the service, in our lives, in how we think about issues. Yep. All right. So here's the psalm. I, I was off. I, I, I had I had lixdexia. So you know, I, I, I put Psalm 129 rather than 126. So listen to this. This is a great psalm. When Yahweh restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. This is a picture of like the, our, our first gawking at the at the new world, right? You know, and, and our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, Yahweh has done great things for them. Yahweh has done great things for us, and we are glad. So restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negeb. Uh, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So the idea here is, is that, yeah, this life is hard. The consequences mm -hmm. of sin are real. And mm -hmm. you may be experiencing the consequences of your sin even in your own physical body with your de you know, degrading health. And the thing is, is that's what age is anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. I... You know, there's no way I can go back to being a you know a 16 year old uh, jumping in the the pool and swimming 100 meters in 56 seconds. I couldn't do that. If I tried, I'd probably have a heart attack, and you'd have to fish my body out of the pool. Okay, <laughs> it's you know. But the thing is, is that in the world that is coming, our youth, our strength, our fortunes, everything is restored. In a world without sin, where we can see our God with our own eyes, and it's just going to be amazing. Worship our God in his presence, visibly see his glory surrounding the earth. We won't even need the sun anymore. This is what is coming. And so the idea here is, is that anybody who's basically coming up with this trichotomous view in order to basically say you can use your spirit man to get your soul valve to do the thing so that you can have the blessings in your body— that what they're basically doing is selling you magic beans. That's mm -hmm. at the end of the day what they're doing, and they're not pointing you to what the scripture says. And uh, and I would say that uh, Andrew Womack, Joyce Meyer, Ken Copeland, Ken Hagen, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo Dollar, and the whole lot of them who all teach these doctrines, none of these are biblical. And uh, you know what? Yeah. I can say every one of them are greedy. And the reason why they're selling you, telling you these things is to tell you what you want to hear, so and rather than what you need to hear. What you need to hear is you're going to die. All right. And there's nothing that you can do to stop it. And today is the day of salvation. So I don't know what you're waiting for. If you don't trust in Christ, you don't. You are not promised tomorrow. Neither am I. So, you know, and, and to just add on to that a little bit, those the, the guys at the very top, you know, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, etc. I don't trust them at all. I don't think they're sincere. I think they're, yeah. they're really bad people. But I, you know, that's not the point. The point is underneath them are a million small time pastors who might be sincere and they don't know that this stuff is wrong because that's all they've ever heard. That's what they've been yeah. taught. They yeah. all have Bible schools. You know, there's uh, there's the Rima Bible school. Even Andrew Womack has his own Bible school. And if you are in a church where that kind of stuff is being taught, maybe give your pastor a little bit of grace knowing that that's all he knows and take the steps necessary to peel back these false layers, go directly to scripture as much as possible. So I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to be too harsh on every pastor in the entire world who might be teaching this stuff because they're, they're, they're just clueless. They've never heard any other option and they haven't been taught how to properly study the scripture. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but the guys at the very top, I, I have no patience for, I think they're really pretty wicked actually. Yeah. And, and boy, they've uh, made bazillions of dollars teaching this wickedness. Yes. So, all right. Well, Kozar, thanks for coming on and uh, a yeah. good topic, good discussion. It's always great to have you. You, you like my new format here? It's, it looks, looks a little more cleaned up. <laughs> I don't have I you wandering this. around. Yeah. The, uh, I want to get this software you're using because I really want to start doing interviews for my channel and I just haven't done it because I don't know technically how to make it all work and to make it yeah. look good or good enough. So yeah. thanks so much for all you're doing. And uh, let's do this again as soon as possible. I really appreciate it. We'll bringing do. up the topic and letting you do the heavy lifting again. So thank you. <laughs> well, great. So and plus, you know, people like like watching us work together. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. But uh, <laughs> and I, we always love seeing you in the in the chat when we do the premiere because you always show up. You say basta, you know, basta. ah, co-star. And I'm kind of jealous because it's like I don't have like a really cool catchy thing to say. <laughs> <when I show. laughs> yeah, you know, I show up and like hi. 
<laughs> Kozar shows up, Vasta. And then when, uh, then the other day, you weren't you weren't even on the premiere, and somebody says, "Where's Kozar?" And somebody says, "No, no, Vasta." <laughs> I gotta anyway. put that on my headstone when I die. I think it's just gonna yeah, say basta. basta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let, let me sign off and uh, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll log out here. But uh, hang on one second here. If you found this helpful, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And so, until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and His vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Yeah.